Look what I have done in this lifetime with this body. I'm a girl from a cotton field that pulled myself above what was not taught to me. The Fantastic Ike and Tina Turner Review! It was Ike's band. But Tina with the shining star. When I saw her dance, she was all I could look at. He rehearsed constantly. And then the pressure came that we had to work more to try to get a hit. And I was afraid. I had an abusive life. There's no other way to tell the story. Buddhism was a way out. I started really seeing that I had to make a change. After the, dark in the, city. the divorce, I got nothing. For the man no money, no house. So I said, I'll just take my name. And then we tried to get a record deal. Nobody would touch Tina Turner. She'd play anywhere just to make the money to get by. And we'll my dream is to be the first black rock and roll singer to pack places like the Stones. When she became successful, the past came up. Her story reached so many people who felt like they had to keep their secrets locked away deep down. It was hard. One of the worst parts of your life has been an inspiration. I don't consider it a comeback. Tina had never arrived. It hurts to have to remember those times. But at a certain stage, forgiveness takes over. Hi, my name is Gil Robertson, president of the African American Film Critics Association. Today we are talking to uh, the directors responsible for the upcoming HBO documentary, Tina. We're gonna start off by introducing uh, the two of you to the AFCA members who are taking part in our round table today, starting with Reggie Pounder in Chicago, our facilitator Katia Woods in Philadelphia, Al McGee in South Florida, Jill Monroe in Los Angeles, Ray Cornelius in Atlanta, Nancy Green in Los Angeles, Rhonda Rasha Penrice in Atlanta, Ruben Regald in Miami, and Kim Ford in Atlanta. I'm gonna let you guys do, you guys and gals do what you do so well, and I'll see you on the other side. So I'm Reggie Ponder, the real critic out of Chicago at 91.1 FM. And my question for you guys is, did you start off with this film making a movie about Tina, but ending up with a movie about Anna Mae? Hmm. It's a good question. Um, go ahead, TJ. No, I, I mean, that's a, <laughs> I gotta give that one a thing. The, I, I, this is what I'll say. I think, you know, one of the dominant themes in the film is this idea of ownership, right? She's, Tina was, was found herself kind of imprisoned by somebody, you know, intellectually, physically, emotionally, spiritually. And she goes on this journey of essentially reappropriating her own identity and also reappropriating the name that was given to her by, um, by, this, by, by, by Ike. So I, I, I think because Tina herself identifies as Tina um, and has really worked hard to earn that title of Tina, I still think it's a film about Tina, Tina Turner. The way I think we look at the film is the two main characters is not necessarily Anna Mae and Tina, it's Tina and the narrative of Tina. And what you're watching is, uh, uh, you know, the trajectory of the, like the origin story of Tina Turner and the origin story of the, the narrative of Tina Turner. And you're watching Tina wrestle with um, accepting that aspect of her story. Dan, was there any thought on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I agree with TJ. I do think there is something in the, you know, whether it's anime or, or Tina, I think the film is hopefully kind of um, giving some 
insight into the person behind the kind of public name of Tina Turner um, and the and and that public persona. Um, but yeah, it's a it, it's a very interesting way to 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 think about it. Uh, I mean, it is something you know that we asked her. How does she identify herself? What does she when she thinks in her mind? Does she think of herself as anime or, or does she think of herself as Tina? Um, I mean, ultimately, she said Tina, but she, but she said it's kind of, you know, she did talk that it's kind of, it becomes confusing. She also, I mean, not to go down a huge, like, uh, <clears throat> divergent uh, trail, but, you know, she, she was actually born Martha Nell um, Bullock, uh, and then her parents changed her name after a few weeks and then a gym teacher called her Anne, and so she's like I've been called so many different names uh uh yeah but she, Tina is how she identifies thank you so much you guys really appreciate that thank you hi guys my name is Ruben Peralta from Miami cocalegas.net <clears throat> something that really uh bothers me uh watching the film is when in every interview everyone was asking about Ike and she kept Given the same answers, but I felt that her real trauma before Ike, it's her her relationship with her mom. Uh, I don't I, and you and, and in the movies briefly uh, like you know touch mostly at the end. Uh, do you guys have something else to say like based on experience like talking to her uh, about her relationship with her mom? I mean I. Tina's relationship with her mom is obviously it's very complicated, um, and I think we tried to do our best in the film to to highlight um, from Tina's point of view um, how she has emotionally kind of struggled with that relationship. Um, I think it would be hard to imagine. Tina's life, I think she would say this, it would be hard to imagine her life uh, had her mom not made the decision to leave um, her father at the age, you know, that Tina was and when she did, you know, that's the, the real kind of, I don't know if it's irony really, but, um, you know, Tina's mom was escaping from, from what we understand was escaping uh, an abusive partner as well um, and kind of left for her own safety and, and purposely did not um, um, let anyone know where she was going for for the purposes of not being able to be tracked by her her husband. Um, so, you know, even that level of detail, yes, I, I think we would have loved to, to dive into that. I mean, one of the things we pretty <laughs> quickly realized in making this film is this could be a 10 part series. Like every chapter of Tina's life is, is almost its own movie. And it was really difficult to figure out how do we encompass this in, in a kind of feature running time. And, you know, uh, whether we successfully did that or not, I, I don't know, but um, the part of the, how we try to filter that is just, okay, let's, let's do this through Tina's point of view instead of us being kind of like more uh, analytical, uh, for lack of a better term, a, a more journalistic approach. Um, and, and how do we kind of create something that feels a bit more cinematic and, and through the point of view of one character? Yeah, I mean, the only, the only thing I would add is, is, I mean, some of it, so much of it is, is also just practical, right? The, she, she's in, simple storytelling terms, Ike is what you're, you're looking, you can watch a relationship, right? You have a character bouncing off of it. Her, her mom simply wasn't there for, for many, many years. Um, but, I, you know, I think, I think the hope is that it's exactly what Rhonda says in the film, which is, you know, the, she was, Tina was able to physically get away from the abuse of Ike but Rhonda repositions it. And that's the way reason we go back in time near the end of the film is, but the pain that she suffered with her mom, that's just something that may, that in Rhonda's eyes, and I, it was evident through Tina is, is still very present. And so, you know, we go through this whole journey of, of kind of, you know, we did our best to try to humanize Ike because I think in humanizing it, it, it 
it's more accurate to the reality, right? It's usually someone you love deeply who's who can be your um, be your biggest nemesis. Um, and uh, uh, but at the once you come to the end of the film, you actually start to realize the pain goes far beyond. I, yeah. you know, we're actually looking at potentially, here's the, to Dan's point, like if we take a little bit more of a journalistic approach, we'd probably explore the cycle of abuse, um, this generational cycle of abuse. Um, and also we'd probably explore a little bit more about the, some of the abuse that Ike went through. Uh, yeah. You know, some of it is really practical. If, if we can hint at it and you can kind of get the bigger picture, um, then hopefully you're, as long as you're not lost in the, in the narrative. Um, and, may, and maybe this is just a primer for someone to do a 10 part series. And we can dive into all of that, including the stuff that we didn't jump into. We didn't even talk that much about like the specifics of like the artistry of her work, right? And, and yeah. the influence she made uh, in music. So um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if we added <laughs> more to your question, but that's, that's yeah. fine. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Morning guys, Katya Woods Couple Soul Show. One of the things that really struck out with me, and it's not just in your movie, but she kind of has said it in a couple of interviews, when she was changing the direction of her career and she was like, I want to do something different. I want to do something new. And she's like, I'm paraphrasing, but she was like, rock and roll is so not black. And I was like, wait a minute, you know, I kind of rewound the thing and I'm like, rock and roll is black music. And it kind of made me think about a bigger question. She never really addresses walking through this world as a black woman. And a part of me kind of gets it because a lot of what was in that world was painful to her. But was there any conversation about that, you know, the influence that she's had on black women, her connection with a black audience in terms of like her non-black fans, any discussions on that? Yeah, I mean, we we definitely had discussions of it, but it's not. Um, it honestly, it's kind of to how Tina positions. Like, look, the there's we we tried to talk about kind of the the racism that is this racism and sexism that is in the music industry is very much reflected of the racism and sexism that exists within the uh, American society, America specifically, and. You know, in going into those conversations, the the thing that we kept coming up against is very much Tina's ideology, which is why should I sit and stew on that? That's and she says it in the film. Like I it, again, this is it, what we've been able to glean from Tina from her POV is I can't do anything about it, but what I can control is the pursuit of my vision for who I want to be in the world. Um, and that's very much in line with, with kind of Tina's MO. She's, she moves forward. She's not one to kind of stew and reflect on the past and then stew and, and, and allow obstacles to kind of get in the way of, of what she wants to accomplish. Um, but I think it's something we talked a lot about in the construction of it because not just also because she has influenced so many women, women of color and black women specifically within uh, the music industry. She is well aware, <laughs> she, she's not one, she's very humble and she's, uh, she's a wonderfully, um, uh, uh, she's, she's, she's very warm and kind of humble and very sweet, but she's also well aware that like, as Beyonce even says herself, there's probably no Beyonce without Tina Turner. <laughs> um, so it, yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't know if you, do you have anything else to add? Dan? I mean, I would just say, <clears throat> you know, in, in the kind of first part of your question about rock and roll and um, yeah. I think, you know, I don't know that Tina, I mean, to her, I think she, what she's saying in that part is that's how the record industry views um, uh, rock and roll, especially in the, 80s right I, I you know she um she, when she talks about rock and roll <clears throat> she's very much talking about a kind of attitude and an idea that she had of it at that point in time but really what she's what she's commenting in that part of the film is more the segregation of the record industry and that what she was up against is as a black woman they were like oh you're the she says it's not in the film but in those interviews she talks about like the 
uh, executives would say like, oh, you're the Pointer Sisters. We're going to put you in like R and B, like right. And um, and she's like, no, I want to, I want to do what, in her words, I want to do what the guys are doing. I want to like fill stadiums, and I want to, I want to have fun, and I want to have songs that are like, um, again, in her words, not about, not about depressing topics. Um, so I, I do think. Yeah, the, the, it is more, it is, she's speaking more to the idea of the kind of racism that is inherent in the industry through the kind of segregation of, of the different musical formats and in the industry as a whole, um, which obviously has its roots in the, in the middle of the century, yeah. and roots much further back than that too. Yeah, I, the only thing I would add is that, yeah, she, the, it took us a while to understand Tina's definition of rock and roll and it's very much a, a, like when she says rock because we associate her as we're like you keep saying rock but you're kind of like a pop artist you know um but she's it's it's an it's an energy and an attitude right so even though she might be categorized as pop i think it's the energy she brings to the stage to hers is, is defined as a as a form of rock and roll um so it kind of took us a while to understand tina's lingo tina's pov of of the industry and categorization and um, yeah, and all that stuff. Got it. Thank you guys. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, how you doing, Dan and TJ? Hi. This is yeah. Al McGee with YETicket.com. I'm here in Florida. Now, uh, one thing about the rock and roll part, you all didn't do anything about her role in Tommy, but that's not my question. <laughs> my question is this. Uh, many times people were asking her about Ike. She said, I don't want to go to about, I don't want to talk about Ike. But did the public see her as a victim and she did not see herself as a victim? And did the public say, yes, you are a victim, but she didn't want to be portrayed as a victim? That seemed to be her attitude when I watched your documentary. I, uh, I, don't, I don't know if I would personally describe it as that. I think what we kind of saw was, as TJ was kind of saying before, Tina's MO in life is about kind of rightly or wrongly is about moving forward. And I exactly. think, yeah. yeah. And I think for her, you know, what, one of the big discoveries for us was, you know, we came into this, we knew the broad strokes of, of Tina's story and, and that how tied that narrative is to her kind of, public identity and and we knew we wanted to to explore the quote unquote story of Tina Turner and start and part of that was like okay what's the origin story of that and we were surprised to find um you know we had just assumed oh this came out with I Tina or somewhere around the success of Private Dancer and we were kind of surprised to find this article in in People magazine in 1981 which is you know the first time that Tina was very explicit about her um her life with with Ike specifically and, and, and the trauma of those years. And, you know, I think we were kind of captivated, I guess, by this kind of inherent irony in that part of the motivation of doing that article was to try to separate herself from Ike, to try to carve out a space of, of saying, I'm not, no, I'm no longer part of that. I want to do this. And, you know, the unfortunate irony being that that tied her to him really for the rest of her life because that that idea of the of of the um survivor uh who overcame all these things you know tina very much became a symbol for that um and uh in in a lot of the public's eyes but for her yeah we wanted to kind of reveal to people that for her it's it's obviously much more complicated than that and even to this day at 80 years old she still um can be re-traumatized very easily by just talking about that time of her life. Um, so I, I don't know, TJ, if I, how you feel? Like, I, I know we never really talked about victim or not victim and never really used that language. Um, I think, and I don't know that Tina would either. I, that's the other thing, as TJ was kind of saying before, Tina is not somebody who is like um, a, I don't know, for lack of a better term, an activist or somebody who is going to put herself out there and say, you know, I believe in this or I think this, like she's, she kind of by the course of her actions 
has become those things. And in, in TJ's point earlier, in this pursuit of kind of carving out um, a space for herself and for the vision she had for the things she wanted to do. Um, I think she has kind of, uh, yeah, she became to symbolize some things for people that she herself, when you talk to her, I don't know that she would ever really articulate it that way. Yeah. I, I mean, it could be, I, 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 one way of looking at it is the initial intent to go public with her story was to disassociate herself with Ike. And then for the next, <clears throat> you know, five decades, four decades, that's all anyone wanted to talk about was associate herself with Ike. So it could be as simple as not looking at herself as a survivor or a victim, it, or as simple as the reason I put this out there was so I didn't actually have to participate in this narrative. And that's all anyone wants to talk about. And then if I were to really like, you know, from what we could, what we've learned from Tina, if I were to really kind of jump inside of her head, I would imagine it's just, it's, it's actually as simple as that. Uh, yes, that's what I saw. She didn't want to be considered a victim. She just wanted to go on with her life. Well, thank you for answering that question. And it's a great documentary. I really enjoyed it. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Hi, Jill Monroe, jacksonstilettojill.com. So my question is, when you started this project and you were envisual, envisual, visualizing what it was going to be and what it ultimately ended up as, what are some elements that became included in it that surprised you or things that you ended up leaving off the table? As you said, it could be a 10 part series. So what are those things that ended up in it that you never imagined or that you left on the floor that is something that you thought at the start would be included? I mean, I can say for sure, just in a general sense, our initial approach was gonna be there were versions of this film that were leaned way more into the kind of meta aspect of it. In fact, a lot of beginnings of the film were was this footage of Tina going to watch a, a early workshop of the musical. And this idea of this, this woman um, kind of nearing 80 years old, sitting down to watch the story of her life performed back to her was super interesting to us. And, uh, you know, we, we had a lot of different versions where that was the beginning and then we would mix in footage with the film and the musical and it got very kind of complicated in a way that I think we ultimately decided it doesn't need to be this complicated and that meta aspect of it was there just um, naturally. Um, so that's one thing in terms of, you know, how we saw it at the beginning. I know TJ will probably have some things too, but I the I will say for myself, I didn't ever think we would put in the like love story, you know, the her and Irwin meeting. Like on paper, that's like a really like kind of I don't know. It just it does not lend to me and TJ's sensibilities to be like, and then she fell in love. But it was just so um it, well, number one, it was just like interviewing her and the way she lit up and talking about that was like, oh, we have to include this. This is, uh, there's so much joy in her, but it also just felt the, the logical, um, uh, it's not the end of the film, but it, a logical kind of stop near the end of the film, so to speak, uh, that we had to take. But I don't know, TJ, is there other? I mean, it's, but that's just to, underscore what you're saying about, you know, so much of the film is, you know, it's kind of, it, on the surface, you could say this is a film about trauma, but it's actually about a film about, maybe it's just a flip of perspective. It's a pursuit of love, right? And Irwin's story is the beginning of starting to kind of wrap up that aspect of the storyline. This, you know, find a pursuit of love within a partnership that you can trust love of self, love of your own narrative. And, and it felt like a natural, it felt like, it was a naturally part of the fabric of, of, of her, her journey. Um, the, I mean, some of the, there's so much that's, that's left out. I mean, I wish in a broad sense, I wish we could had, we had more time to kind of spend on her artistry. I mean, we let, you know, once we realized what the POV of the film was, um, we, we decided to kind of let the performances kind of just play out so you can just experience Tina as a performer, experience her as a vocalist um, and not, you know, and didn't have the need of having like a, 
you know, populated with a bunch of celebrities saying like, we well, got to understand about her vocal technique is this, you know, uh, hopefully you can just see it and experience it for yourself. Having said that, it, I think it would have been nice to spend a little bit more time um, kind of showcasing some of the more standout performances, especially during the Ike and Tina days. And then some of the, some of, you know, cause that's the other thing, she had a career that spanned six decades, um, you know, to be able to see her move and give the same amount of, um, uh, uh, of energy on the stage in her 70s and her 60s and 70s that she was doing in her in her 30s and 40s um, is something that's also just one of the reasons right that's one of the more remarkable aspects of, of, of Tina Turner is her performance prowess um, there's that I, I, I think also a lot of people don't realize Tina I think Tina identifies herself as a performer first vocalist second and part of that is because I think uh, she really, at the heart of everything, wanted to be uh, an actress. And so we had moments in the film that kind of had this, this almost this third storyline of the pursuit of, of acting um, that started at a really young age. You know, I, we had Kurt Loder uh, on the Kurt Loder tapes, uh, got, had an opportunity to talk to her, her, her mom, um, and she tells anecdotes about taking her to the to the movies and uh, as a kid, and and she would come home and emulate the actresses. You know, she talks about this one particular time where she took her to the to the cinema, and there's like a death scene, and she came home and and re reenacted the death scene at home, and then just laid there flat on the ground, and she was like pushing her, and she wouldn't move. Um, but that you know that was the early stages of the origin story of Tina Turner as a, as a performer. And, you know, it would have been nice to incorporate a little bit more of that, um, you know, aspect of, of, her, of her journey. Thank you. Thank you. Ray Cornelius here from Upfront Inside Atlanta's entertainment industry. Uh, congratulations on this amazing film. I, I actually had some emotional, there were emotional moments. It was kind of a, a roller coaster uh, watching it last night, but wanted to know, was she always, um, how can I say this? A lot of times when you see uh, documentaries, the subject is not always so actively a part of the film. You have more of the friends telling the story, a lot of the celebrities telling the story. But what I found refreshing about your documentary is that she actually told her own story. So was she always um, a part of wanting to be, you know, as active in the project or did you guys envision having more of her friends and family telling her story? Hmm. I mean, I definitely don't think she was like, it's not like we signed on to the project. And she was like, okay, guys, let's do this. Like <laughs> she was, she took some convincing. Um, I think if at the beginning, if we, you know, had said, oh, we'll just do this with archive and she would have been very happy not to, <laughs> to do the interview. Um, but, uh, but no, it was important to us, I think from, from the outset that we, that we hear this from her point of view. Um, I, I, this might be a weird way to answer this question, but TJ and I just, uh, as filmmakers, don't come to documentaries. There's, there's almost kind of in the documentary world, there's like a journalism kind of path and there's like a kind of cinematic path, I guess. And we definitely come more from the latter and like, how do we take um, nonfiction, but make it like, yeah, filmic or, or cinematic. And, and so part of that, I think, is like finding our character and whose point of view we're telling the story through. And, and we knew that was going to be Tina. And, and we knew that was also what this, the documentary form offered that all other forms of telling her story don't, right? Is that it's actually her voice, you know, as amazing as Angela Bassett is, or Adrian Warren is playing Tina, it's it just can't ever be Tina. And so to have her and have her around and have her be able to reflect on this unbelievable career she had, but also give us just the intimate insight into what the experience of life has been like for her. Um, that was just something we knew from the beginning that we would want to do. And then, you know, uh, 
I think she understood by signing on to it that, that would be so if we wanted to do the interview, which we're gonna have to do it. But um, but it was as as we did one interview and then filmed a bit, you know, we were she invited us, she wanted us to come film at the house, which was something we wanted to do anyway. So that was great. And then that kind of led to more filming and um and uh and some little additional interviews along the way um so yeah i important to us i don't think tina i that's the the tl uh, dr whatever of it is like important to us i don't know how important it was to tina at the outset but <laughs> yeah I, the, look i think the once we understood you know it was in early conversations that we with tina that we realized um that the pain of her past was kind of just bubbling underneath the surface. It was always kind of lurking around the corner. And, and that was a revelation for us because the association with Tina is, um, she endured uh, some, you know, some traumatic moments in her life. She endured abuse and she made a couple of heroic decisions and and she, she overcame that. And that's the end of the narrative. And, you know, this, for us, the revelation that, as her, as Irwin points out in the film, this notion it's like a soldier coming back from war. It's 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 PTSD. It's it's she makes a decision to survive every day. Once we we couldn't shake that. Once we kind of understood that's that is the life that Tina, at 80 years old, is is living and experiencing. So that really informed the the POV of the film. And to to answer your question, it doesn't it doesn't work without Tina's voice. If, if Tina, current day Tina is not in that film, you don't get the opportunity to actually tell the story of Tina Turner and be an honest, authentic conduit of her own POV on her own narrative. So we were really fortunate that, you know, a lot of these, these kind of, um, I guess, I don't know, what do you call them? Like pop culture kind of docs. Usually you have a limited window with, with, ex said celebrity um we were really fortunate that once you know tina did we did a couple of long interviews with her but she's we were able to build a good rapport with her and she understood what we were doing and and was on board and so she gave us you know a little bit more and more time um with her so that we could really flesh that that storyline out thank you guys yeah thank, thank you hi uh nancy green here with film critique and um, I was wondering about one part in the film. I found it really heartbreaking that she stated that uh, she felt like she was never loved in her whole life um, in terms of romantic love uh, before meeting the man that she married. And I was wondering why the movie didn't go more into other relationships that she had. Well, you mean in kind of romantic partnerships? Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, because I, I was wondering, I mean, of course, we all know about Ike and, and things like that. And yeah. um, I've never really heard a lot about her other relationships. So I was curious as to why that's something that wasn't um, talked about. Like, yeah, with that. yeah. I mean, beyond we did, we did have a um, uh, early cuts of the film had a uh, short section on um her first love which was is talked about in i tina as a guy named harry um who uh was kind of like the star of the basketball team in high school and um and uh i mean not to go down a rabbit hole with the details of that but he you know he ultimately kind of broke her heart by uh by going and, and marrying um someone else and uh um you know even in the mid eighties, when she's like kind of at the top of her fame, she's still, you know, talks to Kurt Loder on these tapes about Harry and, and, and uh, still kind of seemingly having a bit of, of love for him. But other than that, um, she really didn't, I mean, she, you know, I think it was maybe known at the time she, but she dated, um, oh God, now I'm gonna forget his name, record producer. Uh, who was married to Jane Fonda, um, Rupert Hind? No, um, somebody, I, I can't remember. You'd have to look that up. But that was somebody that she like dated briefly. Other than that, Tina didn't have a ton of romantic relationships. Um, obviously during her years with Ike, that wasn't gonna happen. And and 
And when she left him, she dated a few men, but really, you know, she was also so focused on her career. As she even says in the film, she didn't have time for friendships or relationships. And she kind of had this goal and this thing that she wanted. So ultimately there just wasn't a ton to explore there. I think, you know, what we were trying to show is that as Tina says, like when, when she brings up that part, she says, you know, I, I've never had a loving relationship, but she says, how did I get so far without love? I've never had it from birth. My mom and dad didn't, you know, so for, from Tina's point of view, it's about the idea that no one loved her, not necessarily romantic relationships, just the lack of feeling of being loved. And that I think is something that, um, the fact that she poses the question that way, I always find very fascinating. How did I get so far without this, um, as this rhetorical? Um, so yeah, that's a long way of saying, <laughs> of kind of talking around that. Um, I don't know, TJ, is there no, more missing? I, I don't know. I, 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 I would imagine, I think a big part of it is really practical. I think she legitimately, I mean, here's a, a person who, you know, she, her career spanned six decades and it, and it's not, she wasn't just a studio artist. She was out there active touring for, <laughs> you know, 200 plus days of the year, 250 days out of the year. Um, and so she, I, I honestly, I don't think she had that many long-term romantic relationships that she deemed uh, that, that, that gave her the, the, the feeling of love and that gave her that sense of love. So the ones that really stand out for her are the ones that are kind of explored in the film. In, in, in addition to Harry is the one that we, we really didn't get an opportunity to kind of spend more time with, kind of the high school sweetheart. All right, thank you guys. Yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm Kim in Atlanta with IamKimFord.com. With the success of What's Love Got to Do With It in 93, so many came to really know Tina's story um, on screen through Angela Bassett. So were there any specific um, conversations amongst yourself as directors, strategy-wise, or with Tina on how you guys were going to make this either go beyond what was already seen on screen and it's, it's huge success or how to go a little deeper um, to combat those that may say, well, I already saw the movie, I already know what happened. Was there any specific conversations on how this would be different? Uh, yeah, very much so. I mean, it, honestly, as, as I mentioned, well, part of the signing on to it, part of our hesitation, one of the few things before we even committed to making the film was what are we doing that's adding value to the, the, the narrative of Tina Turner? And as, as I mentioned earlier, it wasn't until those only early conversations that we realized the, the one thing that's really kind of been void of the retelling of her story is Tina's perspective on the narrative of Tina, right? Thinking about it as two, as two characters. And, and more importantly, this understanding that, um, you know, uh, uh, surviving is a thing that's for her is a, is a process. Um, and she's still even processing it at, at this chapter in her life when she's, you know, 80, 80 years old. So the, in thinking that way, I, it, it felt like we had an opportunity to, to, to add a new POV to, 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 to Tina's story. Um, and then it actually liberated us to lean in on all these other mediums. Um, so instead of kind of, um, you know, figuring out a way to, to, you know, for this film to have its own identity and what are we doing differently? We actually just said, well, let's embrace all those other mediums because that's very much woven into the fabric of how we as a, as a society has influenced our perception of Tina. So once we decided to incorporate that, it actually just freed us up a lot to, um, to hopefully you know, make something different that gave you that added value, that gave you that, that, that something a little bit deeper because it was not the telling of Tina Turner's story, it's the perspective of Tina, it's Tina's perspective on her own story. <laughs> and also just, you know, I, I, you know, as we've said before, there's, there's a version of this um, that, you know, that is a 10 part series where, you know, you could go into every decade and really kind of explore, you know, 
the artistry of, of the, the, the evolution of her career. And, you know, that's obviously something we didn't fully lean in on, but, um, but there was something it seemed like with every telling of her story that it always kind of ended with the success of, um, of what's love got to do with it. Uh, the song, not the movie, right? And so for us, it was like, if we can at least break that barrier and continue to go on um, past that chron chronologically speaking, time-wise, um, then we'll be entering new territory to see uh, how Tina continued to not just evolve, but how she continued to kind of manage the, the narrative of Tina. Hi, it's Rhonda, guys. I just wanted to talk about from a um, filmmaking perspective, how did you pivot from doing something like LA 92 to Tina? Hmm. I mean, I think our, our uh, filmography in general is kind of pivot after pivot after pivot in some ways. Um, you know, I, I, it's really just like more of a practical thing. We had finished LA 92, we were doing, um, um, some other uh, short form work and the producers of LA 92 actually had already um, uh, had an agreement with Tina to, to do the film and they, they came to us to, to, you know, approached us to direct it and we were actually kind of a little hesitant at first. Um, we had, um, I mean, we didn't, you know, we grew up in came of age in the 80s and knew Tina Turner and like, you know, saw her on MTV and, you know, but we're ever like, we didn't, let's put it this way. We didn't own any of her CDs. We weren't like big Tina fans. So there was that part of it of just like, okay, should, um, what do we know about her? Is this a film we want to make? I, we had, uh, you know, some reservations about two men telling her story um, and, um and then all, and and then just also the, um, uh, yeah, knowing that the story had been told in other forms before, what were we going to be able to to offer it? So, um, but ultimately, I think we just thought that Tina's. I mean, the narrative alone is just an incredible tale, um, and I think we just felt that the the documentary form offered us a way to to explore that. Uh, story in a way that it really hadn't been before again because it's through Tina's voice um, but I don't know if that's really even answering your question <laughs> the you know I think in some ways too we thought if I'm like remembering and being honest about it, there was also this like oh you know LA 92 is a very difficult film to make and very uh, heavy and it was it was it was uh yeah, the process of being in the edit every day and, and viewing that footage and working with that is just really difficult. And I think in some ways we were like, oh, a music doc, like that would be a nice <laughs> change of pace. So like, but maybe that just says something about TJ and I that we're like, you know, it ended up being, um, yeah, it wasn't as uh, light and easy as we uh, maybe maybe thought, but. Um, Actually, uh, Tina's probably the, this is, I in terms of like cracking the code on this was the hardest film. Yeah. I think, I, I don't, I, yeah. We struggled really hard to find how this was all gonna flow and find the, like the aesthetic of it and the, the, the tone and the identity of it, right? The tone itself, that, like the opening of the film is reflective of the tone of the whole piece. You go from this energetic stage presence performance and then it kind of like slowly dissolves inside of the head of Tina and there's this melancholic piano and the whole thing navigates this like big energy and then melancholy and big energy and to kind of balance that throughout was just, <laughs> it was a headache. Um, it's the first film that we also, that we yeah. didn't have a vision for walking into. Like we kind of agreed to do it and then it was like, okay, we got to discover what we're going to do with this. Whereas like, LA 92 undefeated we like had a very clear idea of what we were trying to do walking into it so um yeah it was really difficult <laughs> as TJ said yeah I don't know if that answers your question of, of why the pivot <laughs> well you know I just thought this was probably very very different from what you've done in the past and yeah. so 
Yeah, I look the I I think our our you know if we're gonna get like geeky industry talk, our reps are really always frustrated with us because we never have a clear answer for anything. And whenever we have a film out and there's like momentum, it's always like you know get your next film picked up and you know book it. We just we always we always mess up that wave. We always fall off that wave because it's it's at the end of the day you wanna. Like there's gotta be something inside the, the possibility of the story that really touches a chord with you. And that's, you can't fabricate that. It just has to naturally happen. And so that we were, you know, we felt that there might be something here with Tina and, and you know, that's, that's the only, that's one of the reasons why we ended up doing it. Cause we've been asked to do a lot of other, like, again, these kind of like pop culture, you know, uh, like docs driven by kind of cultural figures, um, but they, so many of them don't have a like a a story where you can actually treat it like a film and they always end up being kind of like they're more like profiles um and so yeah we felt tina's tina's narrative is just so um it's so one of a kind that we kind of decided to jump on it well thank you guys and congratulations thank you Hi guys, Kate here again. I do have this question that you did, maybe you discussed it, but it just didn't make the film. She decided to give up her American citizenship instead of doing dual citizenship. Like she went in and said, there you go, you can have it back. Was there any discussion? Was that part of her? Cause you know, I know that in the film, you know, the play, all of that was like her way of saying goodbye to her American audience. Was that part of it saying, okay, this was my former life and this is me now, and part of that is letting go of the citizenship. Um, I, I mean, we talked to her about it, but my understanding is that it was actually, I think there's some symbolic stuff in there, but it is more practical in that in uh, Swiss citizens are not allowed to have dual citizenship. So Got to it. become a Swiss citizen, she had to give up her American um, citizenship. But, um, but I do think, you know, she, as she told us, the first time she went to London she felt something about it felt like it was drawing her um, and I think just kind of you know uh, Europe in general and uh, you know she she would I think talk about it as like there's something about like well feeling of home but I think you know in listening to interviews with her and stuff there is a spiritual kind of thing of her being a kind of old soul and feeling like maybe she had a life um a previous life in in um either europe or whatever it is but just something about the kind of like ancestry of of, of this um place uh i guess is 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 what speaks to her but um but you know she I, you know you talk with tina and she does there is a, a there is a aspect of her that feels like she was never um, whether this is right or wrong, this is her point of view, that she was never really accepted in America in the way that the rest of the world um, accepted her. And even with Ike and Tina, I mean, they, much of their success, you know, we, we forget now that we know Tina Turner, we think like, oh, Ike and Tina were, but they were, they were successful, but they were not nearly as successful as they were um, overseas. And, and that was a lot of how Tina was able to support herself and especially after she left Ike was to go and, and play um, in Germany and, and France and, and London. So um, I think there's something about feeling, I don't know, TJ, if you'd agree, maybe I'm reading into it too much, but there is something about feeling appreciated um, by European audiences in a way she never felt she was appreciated by in America. Yeah, I think that's totally fair. I'm sure that naturally ties up into the, you know, like it's into her own, as she, as she says, you know, it's, it's, you know, her own spirituality. And, and there's something about, you know, the first time I and Tina went to, to Europe, she just, there's something about that just felt like home. And sometimes it's just elusive and you can't put your finger on it, you know? Definitely. Thank you guys. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I have a question though. I mean, I've been to Zurich and been on the, the the tour of Lake Zurich and as you pass the Lutz candy factory on your right on the left the boat um 
tour guide says, oh, look to your left, there's the home of Tina Turner. <laughs> and everyone on the ship turns and looks at it. So is she happy? I mean, she lives in paradise. You have this Matterhorn type mountain towering off in the distance. And it just seems like, you know, Shangri-La, but in watching this, I just wonder, you know, is she after all she's accomplished? Has she found happiness? And certainly if by now she hasn't, she's not likely to, we all know that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's actually, it's, hmm, the way you phrase it makes me think that there, there's almost a, maybe a difference between contentment and happiness. Mm. That makes sense. Like the, I, and, and I think what we're, hopefully kind of show in the film is there's still a there's still a struggle for Tina that she didn't you know that as Tina or as TJ said earlier like that choice to to survive is something she's still doing on a daily basis today so I think you know there's there's that aspect of it I think what she has done for herself by kind of creating this little utopia, uh, Shangri-La, so to speak, as you said, in, in Zurich, is it, it very much um, keeps a lot of those reminders of some of that stuff uh, out, of her, out of her periphery or her POV. Um, and I think, you know, she is very at peace, I would say, would be our observation from spending time with her. I mean, she is like, you know, she'll literally like wake up, she has breakfast, she goes down and lays by the lake and we'll just hang out for like hours. <laughs> and she's like, you know, and you ask her like, oh, do you miss, you know, she's not the kind of, I think that's one thing that's very interesting about Tina is she is not unlike other, some other performers that just are driven by this need for adulation and 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 fans and all of these things, right? That is not Tina's not driven by that, and I think that's what made it very easy for her to say, you know what? I worked for sixty years as a performer. I'm done, <laughs> and just like check out. And I, I at least I TJ, if you agree or not, but like I definitely get the impression that there's nothing in Tina that's like, oh, I want to get back out on stage. No. Uh, yeah. I, look, I I think at the end of the day, this is probably a question that's better suited for Tina. Um, but I would imagine, like all of us, it, it probably will depend on the day and how she's feeling that day. If she gets an opportunity to garden and decorate her house, she's stoked. She's super excited. If it's something where she's, you know, has somehow has a nightmare that something triggers something that brings back up the past. Maybe that day is not as as enjoyable as as the one previous. So, I, you know, I think like all of us, it's she's positioned herself to try to create the best possible life for herself at this chapter in her life. That's, I mean, that's the way I would look at it. Yeah, totally get it. Totally get it. Um, both of you, uh, Daniel and TJ, uh, we thank you for joining us today for Africa Roundtables on behalf of the world's largest group of Black film critics. Thank you for watching and have a great day.